One of the last things we need to do on this restoration is clean up these knobs. It's kind of hard to see it on the screen, but I've run it through the ultrasonic cleaner a couple times, and there's still quite a bit of dirt embedded in the uh, grooves on the knobs here. So I'm going to uh, use uh, this dental pick here and kind of clean those up a little bit. The other thing that we'll have to do is this is the knob off the uh, CW pitch and you can see the apron on it's cracked there. We've got another knob here off of another S38. And go ahead and clean that up and then we'll make a reproduction off of that knob. So I'll go ahead and use the, the pick to clean that up and then I'll run it through here maybe another five, six more times and they should look good as new. Hey, there's the sound of the ultrasonic cleaner doing its work. Um, when I use that pick, I'm not actually scrape, scraping it completely clean. I'm basically just loosening it up a little bit so that the ultrasonic action can do its work. Um, it's kind of what we do when we're doing media blasting. Sometimes you have uh, something that won't come off of the piece, and if you just scratch it a little bit, it gives the... Uh, um, media enough something to grab onto to, to remove the uh, paint or whatever grease or whatever that's on it and, uh, that's what uh, kind of the same thing I employ here on the uh, ultrasonic cleaner here we're uh, cleaning and reinstalling the dial cover The lens cover is kind of scratchy. Who's oh. that me? 
or uh, send it back to Arthur and he can decide if he wants to replace that. I did find a place where they sell these. So, okay, next step. We've got to reproduce this. Now, I think this was originally one piece of cardboard, but I think it delaminated itself. What we're going to do is I've got some cardboard, it's thinner, or just layer it, layer it together and then glue it. But first I have to cut out the dimensions here, but this this pattern is not going to line up, so I have to figure out how to line that pattern up. with the new screw holes in the speaker. So we'll do that next. Okay, next step in our restoration here is we have to remake this. This goes in there and then the speaker goes on top of it. Well, obviously Part of our problem is since we're replacing it with a different speaker, um, I've got to change where the uh, mounting holes are for the uh, for the uh, uh, speaker. Uh, this particular one, they attempted to put a hole in here and put a telescoping a telescoping scoping antenna, and so they cut this out. So. What I did is I went down and I got some uh, framing, black framing mat. And then I have a piece of black construction paper. What I do, when I put those together like this, it, it's about the uh, proper thickness of, uh, of the old mat there. And then I got some multi-purpose spray uh, adhesive. So first thing I do is I uh, use that adhesive to stick that there, or stick them together. And then I put this in my paper cutter, trim that so they they match exactly. Um, and then uh, I thought what I'd do is I'd probably lay this across here, get it about where I want and press down on it a little bit on those screws so it makes an indentation so then I know where the speaker's at and uh, I can uh, cut a hole for the speaker and cut out for the uh, for the screws there so I'm going to go ahead and do this gluing offline here and uh, then we can take the next step after that all right we have our piece of uh, cardboard or whatever glued together and trimmed off. So the next thing we're going to do is try to position our speaker mounting lug holes. I'm going to just try to press those here a little bit. Okay. So based off of that, what I do next is I take a piece of this scrap paper here, trace around it, cut it out, and try to 
try to make my uh, layout so I can position it over that and then our market. And then of course I've only, I only really want the part of the cone cut out on that. So now I have to figure out how to draw it draw that circle. Which is about a four and a quarter inch circle. So let me do a little figuring on that. And uh, we'll come back here in a minute. Okay, here's what I came up with. First I laid the speaker over the holes, got it lined up, traced out my mounting holes there. And I realized that the old pattern, that's a, it's four and a quarter there, so on the construction paper I drew out a, a four and a quarter inch blank, centered it between those mounting holes, drew around it, then for the mounting tabs here, I use this uh, a pair of tweezers, the end of, the, of a pair of tweezers, it's about right size. So, next step, I've got to go around with the X-Acto knife. I haven't quite figured out any better way to do it. Go around with the X-Acto knife, cut that out, um, then, cut, then cut those tabs out, and then we'll lay that in there, and then we can mount the speaker. So let's see, see if my steady hand can do this. I'm going to go around once first, carefully, and cut it out, and then I'll make it deeper. I'm going to go ahead and get the center part cut out first, and then come back and cut the uh, tabs out. Alrighty then, I got the uh, board all painted, placed in there, putting the screw, uh, the speaker back in. Now originally this model had uh, a regular nut. Um, later on they started using some nuts kind of like these. I'm not sure if you can see it. Um, I went ahead and used these, and the, and the main reason I did that was when I powder coated the case, I for, normally I've got some heat resistant tape, and I'll wrap any screws, anything with threads, are wrap so that the threads don't get powder coat in on them, because it's once that powder coats on those threads, it's almost impossible to get it off. Well, in my haste when I was doing the powder coating, I forgot to wrap these, these screws, the mounting screws. Yep. So I decided to go to these because they cut, they're, they're cut through that powder coating and they actually hold really well. So there's the speaker mounted and completed. There it is from the top. Looks really good. Um, that came out really well. So, next step, I'm going to clean up the bench, and then I'm going to mount the. I'm going to cut the plastic off of here, mount these to the speaker wires, so that in the future, if anybody has to do any work on these, they don't have to. It'll be a lot easier for the to get the chassis in and out. I'll go ahead and cut the blue off and uh, wrap it with heat shrink so it looks better. Um, down here, when these came out on all these, they have a little piece of tape here, here, and I think this one actually had some over here. Um, it was kind of a cloth electrical tape. I'm going to go out and see if I can find some of that instead of using the newer PVC electrical tape. And so I get that taped in and 
I think I have to extend the wires to put these on to make them reach or do that. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> touch up some of the tubes on the chassis and then the next step will be putting it all back in the chassis, putting the bottom on, putting the new back that we've secured for it on it. Um, and then the last two things that we have to do are remake that knob and then my daughter's going to make uh, the new label for the bottom and we'll put that on. Then we'll, do a, then we'll do a test run of it, make sure everything still sounds good on it and stuff. And then it's boxing up time and sending it back to Arthur. So uh, next thing I'll, I'll go run out and get some uh, black electrical tape and we'll continue on. When I uh, remove the lens cover, lens dial cover, uh, it was held on with a few pieces of this tape. There's one piece there, there, and there. Um, it's kind of a, you know, it looks like electrical tape, but it's kind of uh, made out of a cloth or whatever. I don't know that I would have needed to replace that, but this is what's called friction tape. Looks very close to it. Maybe the same stuff. I don't know. I know when I've done in houses, I've seen where uh, rather than the newer PVC tape. Uh, lots of times stuff is taped up with this this kind of tape so I went out to uh, Menards and bought this it's made by GB probably wouldn't have needed to do it I don't know if that was put on there just to reduce rattling or, or what um, because these bent over tabs certainly uh, pull it in place fairly well but I went ahead and went and got some of that put that on there so that uh, we don't have to worry about that rattling or moving in there um, this this uh, cover's got some scratches on it and everything. We're going to go ahead and reuse it. Um, there is a company out there, I haven't used them yet, that makes reproductions for these. So if Arthur gets it back and feels like he wants to replace that, you know, he can order one of those and probably put it in fairly simply. So um, on to the wiring of the speaker and then we'll start uh, putting the chassis back into the case. All right. <clears throat> Previously, when I was working on this, I had replaced this wire that goes to the speaker, and of course, I didn't make it long enough. Now, this wire actually loops underneath the chassis and comes back up and hooks under the bottom of the audio transformer, and I really don't want to mess with that audio transformer. So I went ahead and just spliced it here, and then put my connector on it. Now this goes down underneath and connects to a to a terminal strip down there so I'm going to go ahead and just replace that wire completely. So I finish that up and then uh, do a once over on the chassis. I'm going to go ahead and touch up the paint on these these three tubes here and then we'll go ahead and put the chassis back into the uh, cabinet. Ran into a little problem when I was trying to put the uh, chassis into the case. Kind of a stupid thing I did. When I got the uh, replacement speaker for this, which is this, I measured the depth of the speaker and this is actually lower depth than the original, one of the original speakers. However, the magnet on here is bigger. And what I didn't realize is the 35Z5 rectifier tube when I slid went to go slide this into the case would hit that magnet when it let me put it in. So what I've done after messing around looking at different alternatives went over to my uh, radio stash and found a S38B that had this speaker on it which was in pretty good shape. There was a couple uh, beginnings of uh, tears in it that uh, I ended up patching up but it cleaned up really nice. Now the S38B only has uh, five tubes so it doesn't, the, the rectifier tubes actually right here um, 
because this has got the this has got the extra BFO tube. So what I end up doing is using the, these speakers. I got when I bought them. I bought three of them. Um, I end up using those on either the S38Bs or, or the uh, S38Cs. So we're going to go ahead and slide this in to the case and we're try to finish this up so that we can move on to making the uh, um, front knob. Okay, well here we are finally. Uh, got everything put back in the case. Knobs all installed. Um, I think you can kind of see a light there. Maybe I don't know how it's going to come out on the video. Here's the uh, new knob that we made for the CW pitch. Turned out, turned out really good. Um, Yes, I'm going to turn it around here a little bit. You can see the, uh, we got the back on it. Now the only thing that I didn't do, oops, the only thing I didn't do, we got the reproduction back, but we don't have the labeling on there, and I don't have an S38 to reproduce the labeling on the back, so... Uh, if I ever get that done, we're, we'll get that to them. Now I'm going to stop this a minute and turn it over and show you the bottom. Okay, here's the bottom. My daughter recreated the label for us and we got that in there. Here's the original one that was on there. They cut the holes out for the adjustments below. Really what you're supposed to do on that is you, uh, these pop out here. And so the label comes off and gives you access to that. We even uh, got down, there's a little bit of uh, labeling there. So we recreated that, which was gone from there. So the label looks good. Um, I, don't, I don't age them, or I, ha I didn't age, age this. Uh, I figured everything else looks new. I wanted, it, wanted the label to look new. So, uh... I had everything put together in it, and it was uh, um, looking uh, pretty good, but I turned it on the other day when I got done with it, and there was a squeal everywhere, and I thought maybe the, uh, um, maybe it was oscillating, or what, uh, you know, the IF stage was oscillating, and so I took everything out today and turned it on, and it was fine. So the only thing I can think of is uh, there was something in the neighborhood causing interference, causing, and it was picking that up and causing that squeal. So I'm going to go ahead and hook this back up to, and it, and it was with just even a short antenna. If I put it on my loop, it would do it. So I'm going to hook this back up and we'll see what it does on the shortwave bands now. All right, here's the broadcast band. This is the local KHS station here. Obviously, it's about almost quarter till nine central time at night. So there's quite a bit of broadcast stations we can pull in. I've got this hooked up to my um, 280 foot loop antenna, just one side of it, the other side goes to ground. Um, so we're, we're pulling in, uh, quite a few stations. We'll go to band two. Go to band two and come up here. There's five megahertz WWVL Colorado. Give it a second here. At the tone, two hours, forty seven minutes, coordinated universal time. So 
So we come down here. That should be a uh, 40 meter band or 80 meter band for ham uh, radio. A little bit early for 80 meters. Earlier, when I was tuning around, I could get WWV on 2.5. Okay, let's go to the third band. Quarantine station. This should be in the 40 meter hand band. Kind of early for that one too. There is a somebody running CW. Band spread. Must have lost him there. On these old rigs, it's it's a lot of work to pull in CW and. Single side band. We'll go up, come back to that later. Now we're getting up into fourteen to basically ten meters down to. 20 meters and at this time of night that's going to be pretty dead. Yeah, that's pretty dead.
See if I can pick up any CW on 40 meters again. Doesn't look like it. Go back down to 80 meters. There's a single sideband one. It's kind of weak. But I was able to get that in. Somebody's running a net there. This is somebody else replying, checking into the net. So, it does work. So this is the last installment. I'm going to uh, double box this up and send it to Arthur tomorrow. And I want to thank Arthur and his uh, father, Arthur, for letting me giving me the opportunity to work on this. I hope they're happy with it and satisf satisfied. It was a uh, took a lot longer than I thought it, or it should have, but I perfected, uh, we perfected doing the dry transfer decals. I also, uh, we also ended up putting a isolation transformer in this. Um, so, got those skills worked out. Um, and uh, I also perfected a little bit more. Every time we do the powder coating, we get a little bit better on it. Um, one thing on these old radios like this I want to point out essentially down here I've got the grounding strap across those two terminals there and then I'm hooking the ground to an earth ground from there and then I, since we're running a, a, a long wire basically here um, then I'm just connecting this long wire um, if you were running a balanced antenna like a, um, a dipole you would Take that off and connect. Uh, um, you connect to these two terminals here, and then connect that to ground. So that was probably upside down. But anyway, thanks again for following along. Got a few new uh, followers, and I appreciate that. Um, so until the next project, this is KB Zero ASQ signing out.